Just this one's what? Oh, yeah, there's a real pecking order to this uh, front row, I've learned. I've seen some of you get booted out if you sit in what other reporters think are the wrong seats. So, Abby, welcome to the front row. <laughs> if I had my choice, I'd say you're welcome there anytime. Many of you, just go on up and grab a seat. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. I have a couple of announcements I'd like to make at the top before uh, taking your questions. Uh, but first, I'd like to address a serious situation that happened last night overnight. And I spoke with some of you over the phone last night about this very <clears> thing. Uh, and that is what happened at our U.S. Embassy in Montenegro. The U.S. Embassy in Montenegro is working closely with the law enforcement officers there regarding the attack on our embassy compound shortly after midnight on Thursday, February the 22nd. We can confirm that the assailant was killed at the scene, apparently by his own explosive. I'll refer you to the Montenegrin law enforcement uh, officers for questions regarding the investigation itself because they are handling that. Our embassy has no indication that the attack is part of an ongoing threat, although the investigation continues into the motives of the assailant. Out of an abundance of caution, consular operations have been closed for the day today, although the U.S. Embassy remains open for emergency services for U.S. citizens. For Friday, February 23rd, the consular section will continue to be open for emergency services only. Visa appointments canceled today will be rescheduled in the near future. The United States wants to express its gratitude for the close cooperation with our ally and longstanding partner, the government of Montenegro. We want to thank local law enforcement officials for their quick response on the scene and their professionalism for the ongoing investigation. The U.S. Embassy has no changes to its, outs to its standing travel advisory, instructing U.S. citizens to exercise normal precautions when visiting Montenegro. For more information, you can go to travel.state.gov. Was there anyone in, actually in the embassy when this happened? Well, we typically have people in, in post, uh, at our post 24-7. Other than security. Other than security, that I'm not aware of. Uh, second issue, I'd like to uh, address something that uh, took place in Ukraine. And as many of you know, our Deputy Secretary was just in Ukraine yesterday. I'd like you to turn your attention to that matter where Russia continues to perpetuate a conflict that has now claimed more than 10,000 lives. Yesterday, we received new reports that a 23-year-old Ukrainian medic was killed while he was trying to aid civilians near the line of contact. The incident is a reminder that the conflict in eastern Ukraine continues to rage on. Civilians and first responders face real dangers every day. It's also worth repeating that Russia manufactured this conflict in 2014 and continues to control its proxy forces in Donbass. Russia has demonstrated repeatedly that it can stop the violence whenever it chooses. The United States once again calls on Russia to order its proxy forces to implement a complete ceasefire, to withdraw its forces and heavy weapons from eastern Ukraine, and to agree to a robust UN peacekeeping mission. Uh, I mentioned our Deputy Secretary was just there, and I'd like to uh, read a quote from an address that he gave yesterday in Kiev. Quote, given the high stakes, it's important to be clear about U.S. policy toward the conflict. Crimea is Ukraine. The Donbass is Ukraine. We will never accept trading one region of Ukraine for another. We will never make a deal about Ukraine without Ukraine. I just mentioned the Deputy Secretary's travel, so I'd like to give you a bit of a readout on some of the places that he's visited so far. He arrived in Kiev on Tuesday evening and on Wednesday morning toured the Heavenly Hundred Memorial and the War Dead Wall of Honor, which memorialized those who lost their lives during the 2014 Euromaidan protests and thousands of soldiers who died as a result of Russia's aggression in eastern Ukraine. While in Kiev, he held meetings with the foreign minister, the prime minister, and also President Poroshenko with whom he discussed the importance of Ukraine continuing to implement reforms, in particular, establishing an independent anti-corruption court, as well as the United States' support for Ukraine's sovereignty and territorial integrity. He also gave a public speech at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs Diplomatic Academy to underline the United States' commitment to stand behind Ukraine in its fight against Russian aggression in eastern Ukraine and Crimea, and he also pressed Ukraine's leaders to redouble their efforts on critical reforms and renew their commitment to weed out corruption. Earlier today in Latvia, the Deputy Secretary held meetings with the President the foreign, and the Foreign Minister. He congratulated Latvia on celebrating 100 years of independence in 2018 and announced President Trump's invitation to host a U.S. Baltic Centennial Summit on April 3rd this year. He also reiterated the U.S. commitment to NATO's Article 5. He expressed appreciation for Latvia fulfilling its NATO defense investment pledge from the Wales Summit and discussed threats facing the transatlantic community, including corruption and U.S. support of Latvian efforts to establish a well-regulated banking sector, 
Later, he joined a group of U.S. and Latvian soldiers and children from a local orphanage for a tour of a local museum. Tomorrow, he'll be in Brussels, where he will lead a UN, U.S. delegation to participate in a G5 Sahel Donors Conference to discuss the support of development, security, and political goals in the Sahel. And uh, finally, I'd like to bring your attention to Africa and something that took place in uh, Nigeria. We're still trying to get all the details about that, but I wanted to uh, mention that we condemn in the strongest possible terms the terror attack on a school earlier this week in northeastern Nigeria. The choice of targets, including schools, markets, and places of worship, reflect the brutality of terror organizations. The victims in the attack were girls who were simply seeking an education. We want to extend our condolences to the students and to their families affected by these terrorist attacks and are concerned that some of the students are still not accounted for. We continue to support Nigerian efforts to counter the terror groups. We also support Nigerian efforts to enable more than 2 million displaced in the Lake Chad region to return home safely. The United States continues to provide humanitarian assistance to those who are affected by the violence. And with that, I'd be happy to take your questions. Thanks. Um, I want to start in um, Syria. Okay. Uh, in both uh, the Damascus suburb, suburbs and uh, up north in Afrin. Um, I'm just wondering, and, and at the developments at the UN, such as they are. Okay. Um, do you have anything new to say about the situation in eastern Ghouta today, where attacks seem to be continuing, first of all? I, I think this is a good reminder. As we watch what has unfolded in eastern Ghouta over the past few days, uh, more than 400 or so civilians have been horrifically killed by the Syrian regime. And as we all know, they are backed by not only Russia, but also Iran. It is a good reminder that Russia bears a unique responsibility for what is taking place there. Without Russia backing Syria, the devastation and the deaths would certainly not be occurring. This also brings to light something that we have discussed many times, but although not recently, and that is also the Astana talks, the Astana uh, progress or process. And that was something a lot of you asked questions about. You know, where are you on Astana? Is the United States participating in Astana? Is Astana a good thing? This shows the failure of the Astana process. And that is precisely why the United States government and so many other nations stand by the Geneva process as the best way forward to eventually bring, bring peace and eventually bring about a political solution in Syria. Now remember, what Astana was about, Russia and Iran were guarantors for that. They developed de-escalation zones. One of those de-escalation zones was Eastern Ghouta. So much for that de-escalation zone. They have starved people there. They have prevented humanitarian aid from getting in. We have seen innocent civilians killed. We've seen barrel bombs. We've seen this devastation and destruction. That is cer certainly no de-escalation zone. They can get back to trying to create a de-escalation zone, but we want them to get back to the Geneva process, and it shows what a farce this de-escalation zone has become. So <clears throat> both the, the conflicts then, from what you just said, in both Ukraine and Syria are all Russia's fault. Is that the idea? Not all Russia's fault, but Russia is a, Russia is a guarantor of Astana. Uh, we've talked about this many times before, that Bashar al-Assad was back on his heels. And in 2015, Russia came in, swooped in, and saved him. Now we see reports of Russian military potentially, although I can't confirm this, uh, coming in to provide additional uh, air equipment to uh, bolster the Syrian regime once again, we would say that Russia is certainly responsible for enabling. Okay. Enabling is what they're doing. And then uh, then up north um, in the Afrin area, in your comments about uh, Ukraine, you took note of the 20-something 20, 20 year old who was killed. Mm -hmm. There's a situation, there's some video out now of um, FSA troops killing a civilian Farmer apparently stealing his tractor. I'm just wondering if what what your uh, if you have any comment on that. Uh, these are your partners uh, up there. Uh, if do you have any comment on that? And also, do you have any comment on just the uh, the broader situation with the Turks? Uh, uh, to, to your first question about uh, video, I've not seen that video, so I'm not aware of it. I'm not familiar with that situation that you're describing, so I can't comment on that. 
Uh, overall, as you all well know, we are not operating in Afrin. We don't have U.S. forces on the ground there, so we don't have a whole lot of visibility in terms of what is going on in Afrin. Uh, we continue to have conversations with the Turkish government. Uh, the secretary had constructive meetings with his counterpart, as well as uh, with the president of, of Turkey last week, in which we talked about how we both agree that we need to get back to the focus on ISIS. What is going on in Afrin is taking away from the fight against ISIS. It is a distraction, as Secretary Mattis had called it. It is certainly not helpful to have people take their eye off the ball of ISIS. We've talked about that numerous times before. Uh, some of the forces that we are working with in the east, and as a reminder, we are there to fight ISIS. That's exactly why we're in Syria. Some of the forces that we're working with in the east, we are seeing starting to go to Afrin. They have familial relations, familial ties there. Perhaps that's part of the reason why. That again becomes a distraction because we can no longer fight ISIS the way that we would fully like to be able to do that when we do have that type of distraction. So in terms of who is operating there, Matt, I can't you know get into any of those details, but what I can say is that the more uh, participants that get involved in that region, the far more complicated this entire situation becomes. The further we get from being able to solve this uh, this crisis and to solve the situation there. Okay, last one. Um, the When the Secretary was in Ankara, as you know, he announced that, uh, or both he and the Foreign Minister announced the creation of this working group. Yes. That, that's supposed to meet by the mid-March, or before mid-March, which is rapidly approaching, as you know, February is a short month. Um, and I'm just wondering, it's been almost almost a week uh, since that announcement was made. Are you aware of any, has that progressed at all towards scheduling a, an actual meeting of this working group? Well, it was we have people who, who, we have our colleagues who are in touch with the Turkish government every day, not just on the ground uh, in Turkey, but also here at the State Department. So they're working to set up some times and dates and locations. For those meetings, I don't have anything to announce formally at this point, but I can tell you that we are in, in touch with them uh, to have conversations about when we, uh, when exactly those meetings will be held and what the topics of the meeting will be. Um, it'll be a mechanism and all the specifics of what the secretary and what his counterparts, uh, his counterpart agreed to, will be, you know, will be further defined. Thanks. Could you okay. comment? <coughs> Do you have any comment on the apparent uh, coordination and Afrin between your allies and the Syrian government forces? No. no. You don't no. have any comment and, on that? And here, that and, and let me go, let me go back to this once again, because we are not <laughs> operating there. So we are limited, we are limited yeah. in terms of what we can say about okay. the situation in Afrin. I mean, do, Certainly do you, all of this going on, the conflict that is going on right. is taking the fight away, taking right. the emphasis off the entire reason that the United States is there, and that is for the defeat of ISIS. Okay. My, my question, do you frown upon uh, the apparent cooperation between your allies, the uh, Kurdish forces, and the Syrian regime? I, I think you're trying to, to pin okay. me into a corner, no, I'm not, and I'm, I'm not going to step okay. into that corner. And one more last question uh, regarding the 30-day um, ceasefire, mm -hmm. I think that is being discussed at the UN. Uh, uh, you, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up. Yeah. <laughs> I forgot so to mention could, that, too. Yeah. Uh, could you update us what is happening with that? Is that something that you would support you know, in a 30-day sure. interval, so, so to speak? all throughout the country or in, in, uh, in East Rota? We would very much like to see this 30-day ceasefire that is being discussed at the United Nations. We put out a statement a couple days ago in which we called for that ceasefire. That is the only way we could start to get supplies and humanitarian aid into Eastern Ghouta to try to help the people there. That has not yet come to fruition. We will continue to call for that and to put pressure on that. I would urge all of you as journalists, there's no one who has a bigger megaphone than each of you. Uh, I know many news organizations are interested in other things right now. I know you all are passionate about foreign affairs. You're all passionate about world events and uh, humanitarian situations across the world. Uh, there is no better advocate for what is going on and shining a spotlight on the horrors that are taking place in Eastern Ghouta than each of you. If I can implore you, and I know you do this anyway as part of your jobs, talking to your editors, talking to your producers, saying this is important, this is something we've got to cover, now is the time to cover it. So many people have come to us saying, what is the United States doing about the situation in Eastern Ghouta? What can we do? The answer to that is we can shine a spotlight on that. That is what I'm attempting to do right now. That is what the government is attempting to do. And I hope you will be a part of that, shining the spotlight on that. Uh, I want to thank Elise last night. Uh, she had included me uh, in seeing a documentary 
I'm not supposed to encourage people to go see things or do some things, but I don't care. I'm going to break that rule because I think it's just that important. A documentary last night called The Last Man, The Last Men in Aleppo, and it was about the situation in Aleppo, Syria. And in there, you saw the humanitarian disaster. You saw these selfish, selfless men who were leaving their families every day to go try to save those who were buried in the rubble who, or who had uh, been victims of attacks. Um, that situation is being replicated today in Eastern Ghouta. We don't have to see this happen this way. Shine a spotlight on it. Let the world know exactly what is happening. We will back you in this. I will assist you in any way I can in helping you to shine a spotlight on this important issue. Uh, Elise, go right ahead. And, and I'd also like to mention uh, one of your other colleagues uh, who uh, moderated the panel yesterday from all of Arabia. So you um, did a great job. Point well taken, and thank you. Um, I'm just wondering specifically what Secretary Tillerson is doing mm -hmm. to try and um, negotiate some kind of. You talked about the failure of um, the Astana process, yeah. but um, it's obvious that the kind of Geneva process has lost its way as well. Well, know. the Geneva process hasn't lost its way, and well, here's why. There are so many. There are so many countries who have signed on to the Geneva process. But the Geneva process is something like in terms of working towards a political transition, specifically in terms of trying to negotiate some kind of ceasefire mm -hmm. or some kind of new de-escalation zone. Specifically, what is the secretary doing to try and um, s uh, alleviate the situation? Uh, well, first I can tell you we are, have regular meetings in Jordan and with the Jordanians as we review our ceasefire uh, s zone in southwestern Syria. Remember, that's the one that's worked. That's the one that the United States put together with the Jordanians and a handful of other countries uh, on this de-escalation zone, a ceasefire zone. That's held since July. Okay, that is a terrific model. If we could get that model elsewhere in other parts of the country, we not only think that that would save lives, but help bring in humanitarian aid and help settle the, help to better settle the situation. That's one of the things we need to do. The secretary just had a meeting, of course, with the Turks, as you well know. The secretary has meetings and conversations with many of our partners and allies all around the world to discuss this situation. But specifically, when it came time, when it when we were talking in terms of Aleppo, yeah. um, a lot of the um, negotiations were between um the state department and the russians and mm -hmm. you know i know this there's a new secretary of state but you know specifically the russians are the ones that have that not only are in terms in some ways um you know parties to we what's have, going on there we but have also conversations with the russian government and reach out to the russian government to implore them to stop enabling the syrian regime to do what it's doing to its own people is russia listening i'm not sure that they are but I would encourage each of you to ask Russia, take these questions to Vladimir Putin, take these questions to RT, to Sputnik, ask them those very questions. What are they doing to stop the devastation, the deaths and the murders that are taking place in Syria? I'd be curious to hear their answers. They could do a lot more. They certainly bear a unique responsibility. We'd like to see them do more. Well, are there any, are you considering any more action at the UN Security Council? I mean, what is the, you know, diplomatic, um, path forward in terms of trying to negotiate an end to this because whether the Russians are you know a party to it or they're just supporting the Syrians clearly they're the power brokers yeah. in terms of the influence well, right they now. have their weapons they have uh, their personnel down there that right. are uh, participating in this uh, I have a list of 11 UN uh, actions that Russia has blocked specifically on Syria right here I'd be happy to share a copy uh, with all of you Russia needs to cut this out the secretary has made that clear. The secretary put out a statement. Uh, the White House put a statement out uh, the other just last night on this. This is something we are following carefully. Russia needs to step up. Russia needs to cut it out. I, I hear you, but beyond kind of statements and you know asking them, are there you know is the secretary going to go meet with Foreign Minister Lavrov and try and negotiate something? I mean, we saw with Secretary Kerry, a lot of those efforts you know did not bear fruit, mm -hmm. but there was a hearty effort in terms of trying to. I don't think negotiate. that anyone could argue that we have not made very strong efforts, stronger efforts, many would argue, than the previous administration on the issue of dealing with Syria. And that is, uh, we've talked about that many times before. So the secretary is fully committed to this. This is something 
that he is uh, highly focused on, and the conversations and the diplomatic discussions will not stop. But I'm not going to be able to read out every single diplomatic discussion or conversation that takes place. Well, on this. could you just, I mean, can you at least, you know, uh, characterize what his discussions with Foreign Minister Lavrov in the last week have been on this issue? Uh, Elise, I'm not going to pin the secretary down to reading out all of the diplomatic conversations. Well, is you he know, talking you to know the Russian Foreign well. Minister about We it? are having lots of conversations with many other countries. We are calling out Russia for its responsibility that it has. I would encourage you to also ask these very same questions of the Russian government. What is it doing to try to prevent the deaths of civilians in Syria? The secretary is committed to this, and that's I'm just going to leave it at that. Well, if you could take the question, because I, I, specifically, oh, no. I'm sorry, what, what is the question? The question take? is specifically, what are the discussions with the Russians right now about trying to negotiate an end to this? Because mm -hmm. It's. I'm. I'm not saying. I'm, that not, there are, I'm not sure that they are. Based on their actions, I don't think that they appear to be interested in ending this. However, I will go back and point to uh, the president and uh, Vladimir Putin's joint statement that they put out in Vietnam late last year, and that is where they agreed to the Geneva process. Uh, let me go back and quote some of this for you as soon as I can find it. The presidents agreed that there is no military solution to the conflict in Syria. They confirmed that the ultimate political solution to the conflict must be forged through the Geneva process pursuant to UNSCR 2254. They also took note of President Assad's recent commitment to the Geneva process and constitutional reform and elections as called for under UNSCR 2254. Okay, those are commitments that the Russians made. They've not lived up to those commitments. Okay, the question, if you could take it, is beyond, you know, having conversations with partners and allies, specifically what is being done today. At least I'm not going to have an answer for you on that because the secretary continues to have conversations. Some of those are private diplomatic conversations with the gov Russian government and with other governments as well. That is my answer. Okay. Anything else on this issue? You know, the, the previous administration also tried this tactic of calling Russia out um, yeah. and saying they're on the wrong side of history, they're not doing any, and it had had zero impact. In fact, it, in fact, when it started uh, in 2014 or 20, even earlier, I mean, it turned into a full-scale military operation from Russia in 2015, as you as you noted. So, what what makes you think this time? This administration's calling out of Russia is going to make the situation any better. Matt, I, I don't know what some of you expect us to do. We have a full range of options uh, through the interagency that are available to us if we want to or if we should need to use those. Our best tool, what we do out of this building, is an attempt at diplomacy, an attempt to shine a spotlight on things that are taking place around the world. That's what I'm doing. That's what many of my colleagues are doing all around the globe right now. We will continue to do that. We will continue to take action at the UN Security Council. We will continue to uh, have our people there on the ground, frankly. We have Americans who are there who are assisting uh, Syrians try to get back to a normal life. I don't know what more you expect us to do. You have seen this government, this administration, go hard after ISIS. They have done that at a level that the previous administration did not do. We are, hold on, we are succeeding there in the fight against ISIS, okay? And that is the whole reason why we're there. And then there's this other issue, no, right? No, that's not, the, I mean, that's not the whole reason why this conflict started, I'm sorry. No, I said the reason we are there is to defeat ISIS. That is the reason that U.S. forces are there. That is the U.S. government policy. You may disagree with that, but that is what our policy is. We're there to defeat ISIS. Okay. No one's saying that you didn't make significant efforts and progress even in defeating ISIS. The question on the table is what are the diplomatic efforts that this Elise, administration I've just is... just described... Uh, you haven't... I'm sorry, uh, I'm you sorry haven't described... I'm sorry you disagree with me, okay? I would encourage you to go talk to the Russian government and see what they're trying to do to save some lives. Heather, can okay. I just turn that... Just, just flip it slightly. If the, if the U.S. mission is to defeat ISIS, is that another way of saying it's not the mission to deal with the violence and that... This is Russia's responsibility. No, which you've Russia stressed. has a unique responsibility. But Russia does the has US a unique have... responsibility when Russia has air assets right. in the air. Does the US when see Russia as part of its bolstering mission? bolstering the government of Bashar al Assad, they have a responsibility. We are not providing weapons and material to the government of Bashar al Assad. We are not aiding in the killing of innocent civilians as Bashar al Assad is doing. Does the our US forces are think there it has a in responsibility the East, and our to forces help ease the are violence? fighting ISIS. Does the U.S. feel like it has a responsibility to help ease the violence and what's happening in Iskuta? Is that seen as part of the mission? Some of the some of these things are 
things that we will not be able to talk about, okay? Some of these things will become intelligence matters and other issues as well. Sounds like okay? a no. Pardon me? That sounds no, like a you no. You cannot take that as a no. You cannot take that as a no. Thank you. Okay? Go ahead. Last week I asked you, I'm sorry, I okay, asked right you whether or not you go, had a responsibility Connor, to protect Connor, civilians in me. Syria, though. Excuse me, go ahead. Um, I'm sorry, um, Paul from AFP. Uh, you said uh, that we have a whole range of options, and then you said, I don't know what else you expect us to do. Mm -hmm. So those don't square up, and there's like 400 people who have been bombed, who have been killed over the past few days. Yeah, we, we do have and a range of options. What are those range say, of options, or what can you on. do? When I say, I don't know what you expect us to do, I don't know what you expect me to do here from this podium. Stop. The efforts are. Elise, and some of these are private diplomatic conversations, okay? I'm not enough of this already because I already said UN Security Council resolutions. I've, I've detailed those. I've detailed some of the conversations we've had with other governments. I've detailed our statements that we have provided, not just here at the State Department, but also the White House as well. So we are fully engaged. We have, as you know, a very large government with a lot of various departments, and we have a full range of options before us and ahead of us that we can use. It is not my position, not my role, to be able to say what we will do. Some of those can be defined by other agencies that I can't speak to. Okay, can I follow that up? Um, can you say, can you give us any information about whether there's a, a possibility at the UN to reach a ceasefire, what the Russians I certainly hope there would be. But what are the Russians asking for? What are they standing up, standing this up for? I don't have all the details about what precisely the Russians mm -hmm. are asking for in, uh, in, in uh, UN actions, but we have seen when Russia has tried to develop its own mechanism, like when they tried to develop their own mechanism for the equivalent of a joint investigative mechanism, they, uh, they throw a wrench into it. Uh, with, with a joint investigative mechanism, for example, they wanted to give themselves the ability to, uh, to veto it, to veto the decision by the new version of the joint investigative mechanism. So we're a little skeptical that Russia is going to be an honest broker in a UN, uh, in a UN led ceasefire. We want a UN led ceasefire. We'll continue to call for that. Okay? Um, one, one final thing. Um, the uh, Raj Shah just referred to uh, the uh, Assad government with Russian backing as guilty of war crimes, but not in this specific case. In the case of Eastern Gusa, do you find the Russia, that, that Assad is, is, uh, is guilty of war crimes? Uh, last I checked, I'm not a judge. Uh, that would be up for a court to decide, but certainly the crimes that uh, he is accused of committing could potentially meet that standard. Do you think he needs to be, be pursued I, to a court? I'm not, that, would be, I, that would be me creating policy, and I'm not in the position to create policy on behalf of the U.S. government. Okay, Lori. Yeah, I wanted to follow up on a topic Matt raised about Turkey. Mm -hmm. And the Wall Street Journal had a big report about how you're concerned that Turkey is drifting towards Iran and Russia. Is that correct? Are you concerned about Turkey's drift towards Russia and Iran? Well, Turkey is a NATO partner of ours. They are a NATO ally of ours. We certainly have disagreements with the Turkish government. You know those disagreements just as well as I do. Uh, but we think that we have a relatively strong alliance with them and that we are NATO allies and partners. It is going to be natural that they will want to have relationships with other governments, and we're not going to step in between that, in between that but I think we're confident in our relationship with Turkey. Okay, let me ask you about Iraq. It's getting, you know, you've, you've described the terrible things that Russia is doing in mm -hmm. Syria. Mm -hmm whether Russia's activity in Iraq would be denied, benign. Iraq recently received Russian tanks, T-90 tanks, and it's reportedly considering the purchase of the S-400 air defense system. What is your comment on that, and would those transactions make Iraq susceptible to CATSA sanctions? Well, first of all, we are communicating with governments all around the world, such as Iraq and others, about the CATSA law and making those governments aware of how they could run afoul of the CATSA law and the potential repercussions as a result. So we've made it clear to all of those, uh, all of many of the countries that we work with, uh, uh, information about, about our new law. Um, so let me, I just want to be clear about that. Secondly, I don't know if this uh, deal 
that you speak of is a done deal or not, so I'm not going to get ahead of, of what that may be, but I can just tell you that we make it clear with our, our partners and allies. So it sounds like from what you're saying, if this S-400 deal were to go ahead and be concluded, they could be in violation of CATSA? Look, I, that's a hypothetical, but we have made it clear to countries around the world, this is our law. This is what will uh, cause your country, your government, to run afoul of the law, and uh, countries then need to make a choice. Can okay. I move on? I to, to yeah. Yeah. Very quickly on yeah. Palestinian-Israeli uh, issue. First of all, uh, uh, yesterday the Palestinians said that they would like to see the quartet expand to include countries like um, China and maybe India and other major countries. You oppose that? You know, I, I think uh, we discussed this the other day, that the United States, and we missed you the other day, by the way, right, but the United States is committed uh, <laughs> yeah. to trying to assist with the peace process that will require the Palestinians and the Israelis coming together to work together on this. Uh, if, if it could be helpful, when the time is right, perhaps other countries could participate and help bring countries uh, help bring those two sides to the peace process. In terms of any kind of formal mechanism, I'm just not going to uh, be able to address that today. And one other question. Because you, you like the quartet at four and don't want to make it a, an octet. <laughs> and we'd have to okay. rename the whole thing. Then we'd have to rename the whole thing. A non I, I'm not, I'm not going to box in some of our people who are negotiating yeah. on these very things. I have, I have one, one more question. I have one more question. Uh, please, let me just finish yeah, here. Um, Today, uh, the, Israeli, uh, the Israelis arrested a Palestinian man, Yassin Shradij, and uh, they literally beat him to death after him being arrested. And earlier in the day, they demolished the uh, homes in East Jerusalem. Mm -hmm. Is that, in your opinion, falls under <coughs> war crimes? Is that, could that be considered a war crime, considering that it is conducted by a military occupying force? No, look, I'm, I'm, I've not, I've seen a report. Right. I uh, just glanced at it. Yeah. I've not seen uh, the video. Is that? Same answers Matt earlier today. I've not I've not seen the video. I I'm not a judge. I'm not gonna be able to make a determination yeah, about what but happened. Even the Israeli army acknowledged that. They you know, he died in their custody. They beat him to death. So is that extrajudicial execution in your opinion? I look, Saeed, any uh issue where excessive force is used is always a concern of ours. I'm not saying it was, I've not seen the video, I'm not an investigator, I'm not involved in that process. We continue to call on the Israelis and Palestinians to uh, do things that are constructive that can help bring both sides back to the peace table. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Jenny. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And uh, South Korea, Korea and North Korea. Yeah. Okay. I hope you answer these questions okay. for me. And I will North, do my best. Okay. North Korean's uh, military commander, his name is Kim Young Chul, reportedly comes to South Korea for an uh, Olympic closing ceremony. He's the man who had read the Chonanham Navy ships and uh, also Yonpyeong Providence Island in South Korea. He the provo provocations. Mm -hmm. So, and Kim Young Chol is currently subject to sanctions by United States and U United Nations and South Korea. Will the U.S. allow this terrorist guy? Enter the South Korea. Yeah, I, I think first we would hope that he would uh, take it, take the opportunity to go to that memorial, to go to the memorial and see what he is uh, believed to have been responsible for. I, but, I think that was part of your question. Uh, secondly, we have a close relationship, as you know, with the Republic of Korea. Mm -hmm. uh, the Republic of Korea has worked with the United Nations to have various sanctions waived to have uh, certain individuals be able to visit their country during the Olympics. Our role in this is, uh, you know, working as a close partner and ally with the South Korean government, also uh, in supporting and ensuring a safe and good and positive Olympics. Uh, we've been very pleased uh, with the Olympics, although we are rooting for our athletes to continue to try to grab on some of those golds. Um, I don't have anything more for you on that, but I would just have to refer you back but, to, the government, you know, like, to the government of Korea on that matter. But the, you have a sanctions, the United States, you know, have a sanctions. So what are your opinions? I mean, U.S. Uh, position of these guys coming into the... Uh, this would be, we are in close coordination with the Republic of Korea, and this would fall in, under that. Just, well, as it, just as it did when Kim Jong-un's sister uh, came to South Korea for the beginning of the Olympic ceremonies. But that's other, different. And, when other, military and when other guy. officials are. This is military guy who yeah. was a terrorist guy, you know. It's more, it's the U.S. said that U.S. never negotiation with any terrorist. Mm -hmm. uh, we're, not, we're not involved in any conversations with the government of North Korea on this, okay? 
on Iraq. So I, can, I, can Iraq? Re I can refer you to the government of Korea, and I and if I get anything more from you, I'll let you know. Thank okay. you. On Iraq. Okay. On uh, Abby, go right ahead. Uh, this is on the uh, report that came out regarding the upcoming human rights report. Okay. Um, I'm just trying to understand whether or not some of the reporting that um, people within the Bureau were asked to cut back on references discussing women's reproductive rights um, and removing sections specifically describing a country's societal views on family planning and access to contraceptions and abortion. Mm -hmm. Is is that something that occurred where they asked to cut back on those references? Okay, uh, let me start by sort of trying to explain this from, from the very beginning. Uh, well, not from the very beginning. From the very Please. beginning, back 60 some years. Uh, the Human Rights Re Report is <clears throat> uh, required every year by Congress. Uh, so the State Department with lots of people, our embassies across the world are involved in compiling information, asking questions, in all countries uh, to pull together this human rights report. Uh, the human rights report here is something that's constantly being edited and worked on. It's not complete just yet. The secretary has not signed off on the human rights report at this point. So I'm not going to have a ton of information that I'm able to provide until the secretary gets a final report and then signs off on a final report. Uh, the legislation or the law that we have to adhere to uh, from Congress requires the report to address state action or state inaction on human rights issues. Every year that report is edited by various bureaus that all have input into this. It is all under the leadership of our Bureau DRL, um, Dem uh, Democracy, Labor, and uh, Dem Democracy, Democracy Rights and Labor, right. right? Yeah, there we go, got it. Um, <clears throat> then it's submitted to the secretary once they're finished with that. Those edits are still ongoing at this moment. Uh, we want to make sure that the report that is provided to the secretary is clear, that it's readable, and that it's usable, and that it uses um, language that is in keeping with the statutory requirement, what is, what is required of us. Uh, I should point out that this over the years, including in the past administration, the report has been reformed and revised. Things have been pulled out of the report. Things have been edited out of the report. A couple of examples of those in the past have included uh, labor and prisons, and some of those things have been pared back in the report. Uh, this year, we are changing some of the terms that are being used in the report, but not our commitment to women's rights, women's health, or to human rights whatsoever. Make no mistake, human rights is a top priority here. This is something that the Secretary uh, finds to be incredibly important, and it's a value that my State Department colleagues uh, value here as well. So nothing is being substantively stripped out of this report. There are some instances <clears throat> in which this report has become duplicative uh, of other reports, such as the Trafficking in Persons report or the Religious Freedom report. In some instances, some information has been trimmed, and then you can get it in those other reports. So we want to make this as, as readable and as simple and adhere to the actual statutory requirements of what is, what is required of us. Can you explain a little more about the, sorry, a little more about the change in language? moving from the idea of using reproductive rights to coercion and population control. Is there, what is the reasoning behind switching that language? Sure. Um, this is, gets a little legally, so I'll do my best to try to answer it. So the requirement of the U.S. law, it's uh, Section 502BB of the Foreign Assistance Act of 1961. The requirement is that we report on coercive family planning practices, such as coerced abortion and involuntary Involuntarily, involuntary, pardon me, sterilization. Beginning in 2009, the wording of that, the nomenclature was actually changed, and reporting on that issue was placed under a subheading that was entitled reproductive rights. That also incorporated a lot of data that was drawn from various UN websites and other government websites. So we continue to report on the issues required under US law, regardless of the words or the phrasing or the title, uh, used within the reports, we have not changed our commitment to human rights. Okay. So this is not representative of a policy shift? No, there is, there is not a policy shift. There is not a policy shift. This is simplifying the report. The information is still available. This is truly about human rights issues and what a government is or isn't uh, doing 
to advance or to stop uh, the human rights abuses. So where will one find the re reproductive rights information? Is that going to be in the trap in the trafficking report? I will go back. The terrorism I, report? Well, no, I will go back and I'll see what more I can find for you. But again, the, the report has not been signed off um, by the secretary. It is okay. still being edited. Does, does the administration believe that there is such a thing as reproductive rights? Is uh, that a human right? I, 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 think you is can, it? I think you can define reproductive rights in a lot of different ways. It is something that the United States certainly hotly debates. We've had Supreme Court cases. We mm -hmm. still have ongoing court litigation. We have litigation between the, the private sector and the government and individuals on this very matter. If the United States uh, is certainly having these kinds of conversations here at home, they will be having those conversations abroad as well. But I mean, it seems like that if this is in fact correct, and I'm just reading over, I haven't seen this, so I'm reading over Abby Schilder here, if it's changing from reproductive rights to coercion and population control, that seems to suggest that the only right that, that this administration believes that there is in reproduction is to actually reproduce and to not, and not to reproduce uh, is not necessarily a right. Is that correct? I mean, here is the requirement under U.S. law, okay, that we report on coercive family planning practices such as abortion and involuntary st uh, sterilization. So that is that is actually the language that is used in the statutory requirement. We mm -hmm. are adhering to that. Well, I understand that. that, but I mean, did the, so? But I'm asking you though, since since it was changed at one point to include pr presumably access to contraception and access to uh, abortion. It had, also, if, it, it had also included things like the size of a prison space, a prison cell. It had also included things like labor issues over the years under many administrations. And, and this is like a piece of legislation in Congress. You know, you have a different congressman who will come in and he'll add things on or she'll add things on. A lot had been added to the human rights report right, so over take, the years. And, so we're pairing it get back and getting back to basics of the original intent of the law. Right, but the things are added into it to show the uh, certain administration's emphasis on or, or the, their particular interest in something. And so when you change something like this, it suggests, or maybe more than suggests, it demonstrates that you don't think that reproductive rights is a is a is a priority a human or rights not... is a priority for this administration and for the secretary i'm not going to get ahead of what the secretary's ultimate ultimate determination is or the editing of this so that's all i'm going to have to do on that okay all right so, okay uh go ahead go ahead uh so got wrap then. thank you heather uh you just mentioned that uh the report will change some of the terms but not commitment to women rights in the human rights report. Could you please elaborate I'm, on I'm sorry, that? I didn't understand you, the question. You just mentioned that um, in this report, we'll change some of the terms, but not the commitment to women rights. That's Could correct. you please elaborate on that? What terms has been changed? And then is there any uh, change in the terms against the LGBT people's rights? No, no. Uh, nothing has been stripped with regard to LGBT rights at all. Uh, in terms of the other things, I think I'd address those questions and said that some of this is being edited and so I'm going to wait until a final. We have a final product, and the secretary will sign off on that final product, and it will be presented. Okay. Okay. Uh, let me just do one other question on another. Uh, I don't have any. I don't have anything for you on Afghanistan, Nazir. Uh, okay. Uh, go right ahead. Okay. Um, so going back to North Korea. Okay. Um, so um, it was reported in the Washington Post that. Um, Vice President Mike Pence, while he was there, was going to meet with the North Koreans, which um, when we were discussing with you the potential um, for meetings before the Olympics happened, you were saying that there was no plan to meet. So um, why was that not announced? Was it just diplomatic secret? And then second thing is, why did the U.S. agree to, I mean, the meeting was canceled eventually because the North Koreans decided to cancel it, mm -hmm. but um, like, why did the U.S. agree to go to the meeting um, when we've previously said that we would only talk to them if um, denuclearization was on the table? <laughs> mm -hmm. uh, uh, the Vice President, uh, Vice President Pence, and I, and I can't speak for the Vice President, but I can tell you what his intent was, and his intent was to discuss and lay out our requirements. And it's not just U.S. requirements, it's the world requirements, denuclearization. And make that very clear, make that very crystal clear that that is our policy goal, and that is a goal that's shared by many around the world. Uh, the North Koreans apparently didn't like that. I'm not going to speak on behalf of their government, but apparently they didn't like that. They chose, unfortunately, 
to cancel that meeting. I think a lot of people would have been happy if that uh, meeting had gone off and we had been able to uh, deliver that message to them in a very strong way face to face. Okay. I gotta go, guys. Oh, Thanks. Comment because you did on Tuesday. I asked you about Bahrain and the yes. deal with job, and he was about to be sentenced. And on Wednesday, he was in fact sentenced to five years. So I'm wondering if you have uh, anything to say about the sentencing. Certainly, uh, a, a couple things, and I don't know if uh, many of you have been following this, but uh, it's certainly an important matter. Uh, Nabil Rajab, um, Matt has asked about him before. Uh, let me just reiterate who he is. He's a longtime Bahraini human rights activist. Uh, he frequently uses his international following. He has a broad international following. Uh, his social media platforms, he tweets. He um, uses those platforms to talk about nonviolent methods of bringing attention to human rights causes around the Gulf. Uh, Bahrain's high criminal court sentenced him to five years in prison on February the 21st for comments that he posted on his Twitter account. Uh, there was an unrelated case and the Bahraini Court of Cassation upheld a verdict that sentenced him to two years in prison on January the 15th simply for criticizing the government of Bahrain during foreign television interviews. U.S. representatives uh, were able to attend both of those, uh, the hearing and the sentencing, the hearing on January the 15th and the sentencing on February the 21st. Uh, I want to make it clear that we are disappointed by both of those decisions. The United States government wants to reaffirm our previous calls for his release. We've repeatedly rep expressed our concern about those cases. We continuously continue to strongly urge the government of Bahrain to abide by its international <clears throat> obligations and commitments to respect human rights and fundamental freedoms, including the freedom of, ex of expression. Uh, we understand that he may not be able to appeal the decision of the February 29th sentencing. Uh, if he is able to do that, we call upon the government to conduct an appeal in a fair way that uh, right. provides I, a I fair trial. I actually think that he has opted not to appeal and mm -hmm. has instructed okay. his lawyers not to okay. go take it further. But, uh, but more broadly, so Bahrain is home to the Fifth Fleet. Mm -hmm. Then you have in Turkey, the secretary goes, he leaves. Within hours, they sentenced six journalists to life in prison. Turkey is a NATO ally. What does it say, if anything, do you think about your leverage with countries that you are very close with both militarily and politically? Yeah, I, you know, certainly with, with these countries, <clears throat> we have areas where we agree, but we also have areas of disagreement. And those are two good examples. The example of what has happened to Mr. Uh, Rahil Najab in his case and the instances of what has happened to uh, journalists. And I can't speak to their specific cases, but in Turkey. Uh, we have those types of disagreements all around the world with many nations. And those conversations about our viewpoints are brought up often privately. Sometimes I'll speak about them here. Sometimes my colleagues will speak about them publicly. Uh, sometimes the secretary will, but other times he handles those situations privately because he feels that that's most effective. Yeah, but it doesn't seem to be working. Not every time. That's the reality of this. Not every time do we get our way. Not every time do governments listen and comply with what the United States asks them to do. Um, it's That's unfortunate, true. but it is certainly it is certainly their right. All we can do, and this gets back to something that we were talking about earlier, all we can do is shine a light on some uh, activities that are taking place around the world. And that is where, <clears throat> and I'm not asking you this as a, as a government, well, I'll say this to you as journalists, you have the ability to make a difference. You have the ability and I'm not being, don't take this in a condescending way. You know how much admiration I have for what all of you do. But you have the ability to appeal to your editors, to your producers, to your colleagues, to get these stories out there, to get the stories out there about what is happening in Eastern Ghouta, to get the stories ha out there about what is happening uh, to uh, the human rights activists in Bahrain and other places around the world, the Rohingya Muslims. I would encourage you, and there's nobody better than you all to do it. You know foreign policy, you love the stuff, you know, I just encourage you to keep on pushing. Can you Thank, you. One on Thank you. No, I, I've got, I've got to go. Thank you.